Thanks a lot for that introduction. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm, I, I'm looking forward to learning as well from our next two speakers. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, giving my remarks on labor markets and monetary policy. My first slide, beyond the uh, title slide, is a disclaimer that I'm speaking for myself today and not for others in the Federal Reserve or on the Federal Open Market Committee. I want to start by talking about a basic principle of economic policy making. Now, you may not know it to look at me, but I am not exactly Mr. Handy around the house. So this first rule, which uh, would be obvious to many of you, I'm sure, in the room, is not as obvious to me. So, you know, you have a screw, you want to loosen it, and for myself, I never know where the screwdriver is. It's in the garage somewhere, I'm sure, but, and, and maybe there's actually more than one screwdriver <laughs> available. But my temptation is always to just go into the kitchen and grab a knife. The knife, you, you know, sometimes it works to, to loosen a screw up. When it doesn't work, though, what it can do is just totally shred the head of the screw. And then nothing can get it open. There's no screwdriver in the world that if you take that, take that knife and it's, uh, shred, open, shred that head of that screw open, there's no way you're going to be able to uh, use a screwdriver at that point. So what does this have to do with economic policy? What this has to do with economic policy is, given a problem, you want to use the right tool for the job. So what about for me as a monetary policy maker? What problem am I trying to solve? What problem does monetary policy solve? Well, economies get hit by shocks. These shocks take the form of, say, increases in oil prices, falls in asset prices like stock prices and land prices. And one thing we've learned from the 1970s, so in the 1970s in the United States, we had both high unemployment and high inflation. A combinative monetary policy was not the right tool at that time to treat that unemployment problem. What we learned from the 1970s is that monetary policy cannot eliminate the adjustment process of the economy to shocks. Instead, over the next 30 years, there's been a considerable amount of research in macroeconomics about what is the role of monetary policy? What is it supposed to be doing? And that, the conclusion from that research is basically that the goal of monetary policy is to offset the impact of what economists call nominal rigidities. So let me say, t tell you what nominal rigidities are. So broadly speaking, what nominal rigidities refer to, that term refers to the fact that prices and inflation expectations adjust only sluggishly in response to shocks. And this sluggish adjustment can end up creating misallocations of resources. Most obviously, if some prices are moving faster than others, that means that there will be misallocation of resources across those various goods. Appropriate monetary policy can end up mitigating these misallocations. So for example, if um, demand is low because of nominal rigidities, because prices aren't adjusting sufficiently rapidly, then monetary policy should be accommodative. Now, I have to be clear about one thing. So in, in the, the last three years, the, the Fed has done a number of interventions in the economy. Um, and I've talked about a number of these in my, in my previous speeches. What I'm going to be talking about today, when I talk about the term monetary policy, I'm going to mean exclusively interest rate policy. So uh, the, the, usually this takes the form of the Fed setting a target for the Fed, uh, for the Fed funds rate and then uh, uh, buying and selling uh, in order to hit that target. I'm also going to be including the most recent uh, intervention of the Fed, the large scale asset purchase that the Fed implemented in November. That was designed to lower longer term interest rates. And so that will also fit into, in, 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 into this uh, class of monetary policy. What I'm not going to be talking about is a bunch of the special lending facilities that the Fed implemented in uh, late 2008 and early 2009. So when I talk about monetary policy, interest rate policy, what I have in mind. OK, so what I've told you so far is that nominal rigidities in the economy can create a role for monetary policy, and that, that if demand is low in particular because of nominal rigidities, then monetary policy should be accommodated. But what does it say about labor markets? What does it say in particular about unemployment? When is monetary policy the right tool for that job to, of lowering high unemployment? 
So the way to think about this is, think about an artificial world. It's not the world we live in, but it's a world in which we don't have any nominal rigidities at all. The sluggishness and price adjustment and inflation expectations that I mentioned doesn't exist. And you think about what the unemployment rate would be in that artificial world. And this is the, the unemployment rate. I'm going to uh, use this term U star a lot. I'll try to always remember to use the English as well, but uh, I might just lapse into calling it its symbol, U star. And U star is called many things. And uh, in, the, in the popular discourse, it's sometimes referred to as structural, sometimes referred to potential. I'm going to use the word, the reason I have that word natural emboldened is because I'm going to use the word natural rate of unemployment to refer to this rate of unemployment that exists in this world, this artificial world, without any nominal rigidities. Now, uh, what does offsetting nominal rigidities mean? It implies that monetary policy accommodation should move with the gap between the observed unemployment rate in the world we live in and the, this uh, U star, the natural rate of unemployment. So when you see a U without a, uh, so this is a very big room. When you see a U, I thought this would work. There it is. You see a U without a star on it, that's going to be the U we actually see in the data, the unemployment rate that we see in the data. And then U star is going to be the natural rate. When that gap is big, we need a lot of accommodation. When that gap is small, we need not as much. Now, the challenge for policymakers is we don't have a data set on U star. The natural rate of unemployment, there's no data you can look up to see what is the natural rate of unemployment. And moreover, so, so it's what we would say is unobservable. What's more, the natural rate of unemployment moves over time. It changes over time in responses to the shocks that hit the economy. So that means it's very, we, we can always, we can, we, we, the government produces data for us on the unemployment rate, so we know what the U is, but knowing what the U star is, is hard. So now I want to ask, I'm going to ask two questions about what the natural rate is today. I'm going to start by focusing on a, a particular set of data, the data that's available on unemployment and job openings. The unemployment rate we're all familiar with. It gets reported, we report it tomorrow, in fact, uh, for February. But the government also produces data on job openings. And that's going to be what I, I'm going to be referring to that, the job openings rate, number of job openings divided by the amount of employment in the economy. I'm going to be referring to that loosely as just vacancies. So what can we learn about the natural rate of unemployment by just looking at the unemployment rate and the data on vacancies? And then second question, follow-up question will be, what other data can we use to provide more information about the natural rate of unemployment? So the first question is going to be about this information in unemployment and vacancies. And the starting point for this, uh, uh, answering this question, is going to be the, uh, an obvious observation. In large part, Unemployment is high because job creation is low. And what I'm going to do is take a very particular economic model and use it to try to analyze the sources of low job creation in the economy. And this is a model uh, due to Diamond, Mortensen, and Pissarides. Now those three names, I think, are more familiar to you now than they would have been a year ago. Because these three gentlemen won the Nobel Prize in Economics in, uh, in December for work that led to the, to the model that I'm going to be describing. The main result is going to be these data alone, the unemployment and vacancies data alone, are not conclusive. And here's why it's not conclusive. It's possible that the low job creation we see out there is due only to real factors. And one example I'll, I'll talk about is unemployment insurance benefits, but I'll talk about other examples when we, in, in the context of the talk. In that case, it may be true that the natural rate of unemployment is nearly as high as the unemployment rate itself. In that scenario, current monetary policy is overly accommodative. So that, but that's just one scenario. It's also possible that nominal rigidities are playing a significant role. And then the natural rate of unemployment is going to be much lower than the unemployment rate. And the current level of accommodation is appropriate. 
So just looking at these data alone, the unemployment and vacancies data alone, does not tell you what the natural rate of unemployment is with any certainty, and it leaves you uncertain then about the, current, uh, the appropriateness of the current level of accommodation. I'm going to be using, as I described, a particular model, a model which, which has a, a lot, has been used a lot in economics to think about unemployment. That's why uh, these three gentlemen won the Nobel Prize. But it is one model. And I want to give you uh, some confidence in the fact that even though I'm using one model, uh, you, should be, you should be trusting the answer I'm getting out here. The reason that people are often skeptical about the uses of models in economics is you're bringing auxiliary information to bear on the data. And it's just one source of information, this one particular model. I actually share some of that skepticism and that concern when that model is being used to deliver a specific answer. Here what I'm telling you is, even if I bring this rather specific form of auxiliary information to bear on the data, the data remains uninformative. So expanding the class of models to maybe uh, to look at a broader class is only going to rise to even more uncertainty about what the natural rate of unemployment might be when we are looking at this very particular uh, set of data, that is the unemployment and vacancy. So that's uh, troubling. You know, as a monetary policymaker, we want to have some information about the natural rate of unemployment in order to judge what kind of uh, level of policy accommodation is appropriate. So the second question then is, what other data can we return to? And it turns out, fortunately for us, there are other data that are very useful in this regard. And the, the other data is data in surveys, both formal and informal, of businesses. And the data, and, and, and I'll emphasize maybe even more importantly, the data in inflation itself is very informative about where we stand in terms of this gap between unemployment and the natural rate. And this auxiliary information, as I'll describe, does support the current level of monetary policy accommodation being used by the FOMC. So I want to, I want to clarify one thing before I get into the meat of the talk which is my question is that of a policymaker. And so my question is, what is the natural rate of unemployment now? I'm not asking what was the natural rate of unemployment in December 2008. So I'm not going back and trying to think about uh, what was the appropriate monetary policy combination at that stage. There are many reasons to think that the natural rate of unemployment changes over time. This is, and, and what policymakers need to know is the current level of the natural rate and also some uh, be able to formulate some forecasts of what the evolution of this is likely to be over time. Um, certainly from an intellectual uh, point of view, it is interesting to think about natural rate of unemployment in the past, but it's not uh, uh, important from our, our standpoint as policymakers right now. OK, so that was my introduction. In terms of the outline of the talk, what I'm going to be doing is going to go through the Diamond, Mortens, and Pissarides model. And when I say through, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to sketch it, it uh, give you a skeletal look at it. Um, I, I think what we'll see from the use of the model, what the model is going to be useful for us is it's going to take, it's, what, it's the essence of what's great about economics. You take verbal explanations that are floating around and you quantify them and codify them in a way that we can actually use. And that's what, uh, how I'm going to use this Diamond and Morton's this, uh, this framework. Then I'll apply the model to the information that's available in the unemployment vacancies data. I'll turn to other sources of information, and then I'll, I'll wrap it with some conclusions. So here's how the, the Diamond, Morton's, and Pissarides model works. The main decision maker in the, the model is a firm. And the firm pays a cost, K, makes a decision about whether to pay a cost, K, to create a job opening, to create a, a, a vacancy. What are this cost supposed to be? It's the cost of thinking about what is this worker going to be doing for the firm, formulating the tasks, um, formulating the committee to think about who that worker is going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With some probability, so once you create the vacancy as a firm, there's a probability of attracting a qualified applicant for the firm. Once you attract that qualified applicant, the firm and the applicant then bargain over the wage. There's, So that's the way the model works. You create a vacancy, you hope the vacancy attracts a qualified applicant, and then you bargain with that qualified applicant when they show up. 
the key model variable is the ratio u over v. Now what is u, what is v? u is the unemployment rate, and v is the vacancy rate. So, and so as I've mentioned before, it's the job, number of job openings divided by the uh, number of people employed in the country. The key, there's key, two reasons this variable is important in the model. Inside the model, a firm is more likely to attract a qualified applicant. So I said a vacancy has some likelihood of attracting a qualified applicant. The firm is more likely to attract a qualified applicant if this ratio is high. Why does that make sense? Well, there's a lot of unemployed people out there. It's more likely that any given job opening you post is going to be able to attract a qualified applicant. And that's captured in the model. As well, there's a secondary force in the model, which is that when unemployment is high relative to the number of job openings, workers are more willing to accept lower wages. And so for both those reasons, this variable, the ratio of unemployment to vacancies, is very important in the model. Now here's what I'm going to use the model for. I told you the firm pays a cost K to create a vacancy. I, the model delivers a slick formula for the firm's benefit from that vacancy. It's very intuitive and very clear given, the, given what, uh, very easy to use. And here's the approximate formula. It's that U over V ratio times P minus Z. And I'll have to tell you what P minus Z is in a moment times some constant term you don't need to worry about. If you're used to working with this model, in the, this, actually this version of the formula might not be uh, uh, familiar to you. It's an approximation that works well for standard parameterizations. And I have some technical lines, uh, notes online that if you want to want to want to see how that how I, how you get to this formula. So what are the definition of terms in this in this? P is the worker's expected productivity at the job. And here I want to emphasize net of taxes. So the, the firm and the worker are concerned about how much productive is the worker going to be net of the taxes the government is going to be taking away from, 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 the, uh, from, the, from that worker uh, and from that firm. Z is the worker's flow benefits of not working. And, and the, the benefit I'm going to be emphasizing the most is when you're not working and you're unemployed, you'll be able to collect unemployment insurance benefits. But there are other benefits as well of, 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 of not being at work. So those are the definitions. So the P, so here's the formula again. I'm so bad at this laser thing. There's, there's U over V. So let's start, first talk about where this, why is this the right sign? Why is this, the, what's the intuition for the formula? This is, remember, this is the benefits of the firm's, uh, the benefit of the firm of creating a job. So they pay the cost K. Why do they pay the cost K? It's in order to get this, uh, to create a vacancy. They pay that cost K in order to get these benefits. If this rises as U over V rises, for two reasons. First, when you create a vacancy, when unemployment, and there's a lot of unemployed people relative to the job openings, you're more likely to attract a qualified applicant. And so, um, your benefits of job creation are higher when unemployment is high relative to the number of vacancies in the, in the economy. Second, the applicants are more willing to accept a lower wage. And so the firm is going to get a bigger share of that productivity that the worker is able to generate when, when in, in times where there are more unemployed people relative to, to vacancies. Now, why is it rises, P rises? Well, as the workers generate more output, the, the job is more valuable, and so be, there's more benefits to the firm to creating that job. At the same time, this is a little less intuitive. If you go back to the formula, there's P minus Z. So as Z goes up, the, the benefits of not working go up to the worker. Then P minus Z is going to fall, and the benefits of job creation for the firm are going to fall. Why is that? Well, it's because the firm is going to, if the worker is getting a lot of benefits from not working, the firm needs to pay a higher wage to attract that worker to work. And so that's why uh, the benefits of job creation go down for the firm if Z is high. Now, why is the model useful? It's because this formula highlights the puzzle, what appears to be a puzzling lack of job creation in the United States right now. 
We can now take the data, and the data is going to be, we got um, in December 2007, the unemployment rate was 5%, just before the recession started, or right at the beginning of the recession. And the vacancy rate um, from the job openings and uh, labor turnover survey data was 3.1%. Three years later, in December 2010, the unemployment rate was considerably higher, 9.4%, and the vacancy rate was 2.3%. The ratio of U over V is two and a half times higher in December of 2010. So if you go back to our formula here, it's U over V times P minus Z. U over V, that unemployment to vacancy ratio, has gone up by two and a half times in three years. The benefits of creating a job seem to have risen enormously, whereas the costs have probably not changed at all. So the question is, why aren't firms creating jobs, given these large benefits that, that uh, appear to be available to them? And it's answering this question, sorting through the answer to this question, that will lead us to U star. That is the natural rate of unemployment. So now I've got my model. I've got my formula that U over V times P minus Z. And now I'm going to turn the information that's in the unemployment and vacancies data. And the question, uh, uh, our question on the table is, why aren't firms creating jobs given what appears to be the large benefits, extra benefits of job creation, relative to December 07? Now, the standard explanation is that demand is insufficient. And what this means is that the firms believe that they can't sell more than their current production. There's no reason to hire a worker if that worker is going to be producing goods for you that you can't go out and sell to any consumers. And so they don't hire more workers. But implicit in these explanations, the heart of these explanations, is something about prices. The firms can't or won't cut prices to generate more demand. Insufficient demand means the prices aren't adjusting effectively for some reason. So this is what, when I talk about nominal rigidities, it's exactly this explanation, this notion that, I'm, uh, uh, that, that monetary economists and my, myself are capturing. Nominal rigidities are generating low output, and high unemployment. And in this case, if this is the explanation for the lack of job creation, lack of demand, then in this case, the natural rate of unemployment is much lower than the unemployment rate. But there are other sources of low job creation buried in the diamond morton Pissaridis model. And it suggests other possible explanations for low job creation. So let's go back to the formula. We had our U or V term, and I've told you that rose, unemployment to vacancies rose by two and a half times. But there are other terms in this formula. And the question is, how did they change over the last three years? In particular, why might after-tax productivity have changed in the last three years? Now, I'm going to emphasize here, I'm going to be talking about taxes. I'm not talking about taxes uh, uh, that uh, changes in taxes that we've actually seen. What I'm talking about is expected increases in taxes. So over the last three years, we've seen large increases in the federal debt. We've seen a large increase in the federal deficit. We, uh, 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 as we heard mentioned already this morning, a lot of states are facing uh, budgetary challenges. There's reasons firms might be worried, they might expect that these budgetary challenges might be met in some fashion by tax increases. Now these tax increases, and one thing that's important to keep in mind, that taxes of a variety of kinds affect the after-tax productivity available to firms and workers. Most obviously, if you tax corporate income, the firm is able to take home, the owners of the firm are able to take home less of the productivity generated by a worker, and that is essentially a shrinkage then in the productivity that's being generated by that worker for the firm, or for the worker. It's going off to the government. As well, personal income taxes. The, the, the share that the worker takes home in this case is being taxed uh, um, by personal income. And in that case, again, there's less for the worker and the firm to share with one another. Finally, if you even increases in sales taxes influences, because that affects how much of the productivity is 
um, actually getting to the consumer. So all these forms of taxes, federal, state, corporate, personal, and sales, end up affecting after-tax productivity. The other uh, possible uh, change that firms might be worried about is expected increases in input prices, like energy. If you think about when you hire a worker, you have to use a certain amount of electricity for that worker to be effective, and that electricity or energy is going up in price, that could also be a, a reason why you think of that worker uh, after-tax productivity is actually being lower. Now, what about changes in Z, the benefits of not working? Why might that have risen uh, since in the last three years? Well, there have been extensions in, the, in unemployment insurance benefits. And that is one reason why you might think that it's, it's, uh, the benefits of not working have, have risen in the last three years. So these are, are tentative numbers. And they're, they're, they're to illustrate, only to illustrate the point that there's a lot of uncertainty left once we, about the natural rate of unemployment when we look at the unemployment vacancy data. So Dale Mortensen and Ava Najapal, so Dale Mortensen is the same Mortensen that I mentioned earlier, still a very active researcher uh, that I mentioned earlier as having won the Nobel Prize. Uh, they have a paper where they set P equal to 1 and Z equal to 0.73. The question is, suppose in the last three years we'd had a 10% fall in P and a 0.05 increase in Z. These are very large, but not entirely implausible changes in these, in these, in these um, values in the, uh, for, 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 for firms and for workers. So if P and Z were to change like this, a 10% fall in P, a 0.05 increase in Z, what happens to the benefits from job creation? Well, I told you U over V going up by two and a half times. If P and Z change the way I described, it go, P minus Z goes from 0.27 down to 0.12. And this increases by only 11%. The product of two and a half times P minus, uh, excuse me, of U, the, uh, U over V, the unemployment vacancy ratio, times P minus Z now rises by only 11% because the fall in P minus Z offsets the increase in the unemployment vacancy rate to that extent. In this scenario, where we have this big change in P and Z, nominal rigidities are much less significant. And U star, the natural rate of unemployment, is not much lower than the unemployment rate. So this is the, this, this is the summary of what we get to from this. The unemployment vacancy rate has gone up two and a half times. That's in the data since December 07. And by itself, this increase suggests that nominal rigidities are constraining job creation. And the natural rate of unemployment, then, is well below the observed unemployment rate. But it is possible that productivity has fallen and that the, the flow benefits to workers of not working have risen. If these changes are as large as I described, then the job creation benefits are not up by two and a half times, not up by 150%. They're up instead by only 11%. And then nominal rigidities are not constraining job creation much, and the natural rate of unemployment would be nearly as high as the unemployment rate. <coughs> the, the bottom line from this is that the aggregate unemployment vacancies data, even viewed through the lens of this uh, very tight framework, are inconclusive of what the natural rate of unemployment is. And these data alone, just looking at unemployment and vacancies alone, what cannot tell you what the appropriate level of monetary policy accommodation is. Now, one thing that uh, I've left out, one factor I've left out it, it, that has received a lot of attention um, over the, over the uh, past year especially, is there is another factor that could increase the natural rate of unemployment. And that is what's called labor market matching efficiency. If labor market matching efficiency fell, then the natural rate of unemployment would rise. Now, what do I mean by labor market matching efficiency? It's a long technical phrase. What this means is that the firm's probability of finding a qualified applicant is actually lower than would be implied by the high value of unemployment that we see out there in the data. So there's a lot of unemployed relative to the number of job openings. It's gone up by two and a half times. We know that. And when that means that the probability of finding a qualified applicant should go up. 
but it seems when you look at the data that that has not gone up by as much as you would think given how much uh, the unemployment to vacancy rate has, 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 has increased. And I, I, I say when you look at the data, what I really mean is if you take the Diamond Mortensen Pissarides model and apply it to this data, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but it does provide an estimate of the post-2007 fall in labor market matching efficiency. It seems like vacancies are not attracting qualified applicants at, as fast, as easily as you would think, given how many unemployed uh, people there are relative to the, to the job openings. But even when you add this estimate, you might think this estimate might tighten things up a, a little bit on, on what the natural rate of unemployment is. But it turns out the, the range of the natural rate is very high. And here's the, the range. If you think that P minus Z hasn't changed at all, the natural rate might be as low as 5.9%. Slightly higher than the 5% we had in, in 2007. Or the natural rate might be as high as 8.9% if you think that after-tax productivity has fallen by 0.15, or P minus Z has fallen by 0.15. So those are the two scenarios. The one where not much has happened with P minus Z, and then U star is, is low, 5.9%, or the scenario where you think P minus Z has fallen by as much as I described, and then it might be as high as 8.9%. So that's a big range. What that means is we have to go to other data. We have to get other sources of information to inform us about what the natural rate of unemployment is. And what are those other sources of information we can turn to? So the basic intuition when you're looking for other sources of information is what is the intuition I used th uh, uh, when I talked about um, um, the natural rate of unemployment to begin with. The natural rate of unemployment is low relative to the observed unemployment rate if nominal rigidities are keeping demand low. So what we need is information about the state of demand. And if we get that information, then we'll have be, be on our way to figuring out more about the gap between natural rate of unemployment and, and the unemployment rate. <clears throat> so one piece of information is survey evidence. There are various surveys of businesses about the impediments to job creation. In particular, the National Federation of Independent Business has some questions it asks its members about this. Reserve bank presidents is what we do. We ask business people about these, these kinds of questions all the time. What seems to be causing low job creation for you? What I find when I ask these questions, when I look at these surveys, is insufficient demand shows up first as an answer. And then there are concerns expressed about taxes and regulation. And this is very loose evidence, but it does suggest that while you, the natural rate of unemployment may have risen in the last three years, it's still low relative to um, the, the, the observed unemployment rate. I think a more uh, compelling piece of information is in inflation itself. And here, uh, talking about somewhat crude inflation heuristics. And by crude, I mean, I'm going to mean unsophisticated. I won't mean off color. So the, the unemployment rate. If the gap between the unemployment rate and the natural rate of unemployment is high, then nominal rigidities are pushing down demand. And this should be shown up somehow in inflation. If we are having this depressed demand, we should be, the nominal rigidity should be pushing demand down in some fashion. And, and so we should be able to see that in inflation itself. The basic idea is a very simple one. If you have low demand, we should see downward pressure on inflation. Now, the problem with this is, is always it depends on the exact model. It depends on the exact model of price setting you have, the exact model of expectations, how the sluggishness that I described actually plays out. But I'll describe two different kinds of models here, and I'll, I'll talk about how that works. So the older models that are um, out there, macroeconomic models, the gap between unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment is high when inflation is low relative to past inflation. So that what matters is how is inflation changing over time? The newer models developed in the last 10 or 15 years, the gap between the observed unemployment rate and the natural rate is high when inflation is low relative to the expectations. They're more forward looking. So they're relative to the expectations of inflation. So this symbol here refers to the expectations of inflation. 
Now, we'd be in tr it's challenging if these, these two, two approaches, the older models and newer models, give you different answers. Right now, that's not the case. These models, all these models, however you look at the inflation data, you get the same answer out. In the second half of 2010, core PC inflation was 0.5 percent, 50 basis points. And, and this is, and I sh should say on the slide, at an annualized rate. This is pretty much the lowest observation that we've seen ha for this series in the last 50 years. It's low compared to the previous observations or of core uh, PC inflation. And it's low compared to future core PC inflation, which is expected to be um, uh, in the low ones in, during 2011. So both new and old models suggest that the gap between unemployment rate and the natural rate is significantly positive. Okay, so here what we're doing is going to inflation, trying to infer the state of demand from inflation, and then using that to back out, figure out something about the gap between unemployment and the natural rate of unemployment. So let me wrap up here. Is high unemployment mainly due to nominal rigidities, or is it mainly due to other factors? That's the question that confronts us as monetary policymakers. And the problem is the aggregate data on unemployment and vacancies just aren't definitive on this. And so you can't look at those data alone, because you end up with a broad, wide range of possible answers when you look at that data. If you look at other data, you look at uh, survey data, you look at inflation data, those data imply that the gap between uh, the observed unemployment rate and the natural rate of unemployment is, in fact, significantly positive. When you, that tells you, that t translates into the policy conclusion that it's appropriate for monetary policy to be highly accommodative uh, as it is. What about in the future? So in the future, I think there are good reasons to expect both the unemployment rate, as we uh, uh, observed unemployment rate, and the natural rate to fall. So you have both these variables falling. It doesn't really tell you about what's happening to the gap between them. And that's going to remain a challenging question. What's going to happen to the difference between these as we go forward? And that raises the question, when will the FOMC need to cut back on its, its, uh, uh, its current level of accommodation? And the Federal Market Committee is going to continue to reevaluate. There'll be new information coming online, coming to us, and we'll have to continue to reevaluate this question about whether or the appropriateness of, the, of our monetary policy stance. In that exercise, I myself will be paying close attention to the behavior of core inflation. Just as I described to you, core inflation has a lot of information about the state of demand. That seems to be the right variable to be looking at if we want to be figuring out what this gap is between unemployment and the natural rate. I'm out of slides. Thank you very much.